Hello folks, J. Scott Phillips here, and today we are bound for murder most foul, because it's March Mystery Madness going on right now, all month long, and that is a uh, venerable booktube event, now in its ninth year, uh, to get you to read mystery fiction. Uh, this event was created nine years ago uh, by uh, Lizzie Fay Loves Books and Troy Tao, and I'll leave links to their announcement videos for March Mystery Madness this year in the notes down below. And it is, of course, to get us to be reading mystery fiction. And being the ninth year, the theme this year is to the nines. And so all the reading prompts and suggestions are based around that number nine. And uh, for instance, the one I'm going to be following here, and by the way, I'm kind of having to rush this out now because I'm almost out of March completely. And so uh, before that window closes, I want to get uh, at least one uh, mystery video up. And following that 999 prompt, prompt uh, that is for uh, uh, 999 is the UK emergency phone number. Here in the United States, it's 911. But uh, the 999 prompt is then to get us to read a, a British mystery. So I'm going to be covering the very first Dr. Gideon Fell novel, Hag's Nook by John Dixon Carr. And there's a look at the cover. We'll get a, a closer look at this once we get into the cover art section of the video. There's uh, uh, quite a few that we can uh, chat about. Some are, are pretty interesting. Uh, but uh, another one of the prompts is um, uh, to read the ninth a book in a series of mysteries. And uh, I thought about doing that, but as far as uh, Dr. Gideon Fell goes, uh, I did a video last year of the ninth Dr. Fell book, and that was called uh, The Crooked Hinge. So I'll leave a link to that video down below in case you're interested in that one. Uh, so this time, instead of going with the, with the ninth one, since that's already covered, uh, I'm going back to the very first uh, Dr. Gideon Fell book, Hag's Nook. And uh, it is considered to be a British mystery. Uh, I guess uh, it's a technicality involved here. Uh, John Dixon Carr was an American writer. However, he lived for quite a bit of his career in England, and uh, he loved uh, the, uh, the English countryside and the British people. And uh, so he decided he would write British mysteries. But although he is an American, so a uh, little uh, hands across the water kind of a thing here with this one. But let's take a little uh, look at John Dixon Carr before we get into chatting about the book. John Dixon Carr was born in 1906 in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, here in the good old USA. Uh, and he did travel to Europe a couple times in his early 20s. He mostly stayed in Paris but he did knock around the rest of Europe and uh, England a bit. And on his first trip in 1927, he met a young girl in London that uh, impressed him quite a bit. So much so, in fact, that he wound up uh, patterning his character Dorothy Starbirth after her. That's the, uh, the main female character in Hag's Nook that we're looking at today. And on his second trip in 1930, he wound up meeting his future wife Clarice, she was a British girl uh, traveling outside of her native England for the first time in her life, and they wound up meeting uh, on the ocean liner on the trip back to New York. She was going to America, and of course that's where he lived, and they hit it off. And while they were getting to know each other, he discovered that she liked reading mystery novels. Well, uh, by this time, Carr had already written and had published his first mystery novel, It Walks by Night. So he had a copy of it and lent it to her to read on the voyage home. And uh, she told him that she quite enjoyed it. But apparently she may have uh, told him that she liked it a little more than she may actually have. Uh, but uh, they were just striking up this shipboard romance and everyone was on good behavior and uh, that's just the kind of a girl she was. So uh, it worked out well, though, because uh, once they got to America, she stayed there for a while, and uh, they were courting for a couple of years, and they wound up getting married in 1932 in Brooklyn. And uh, since she was a British girl and was always talking about her homeland and all that, and Carr had been there and also liked England, he thought that maybe his next 
mystery that he would write should be a British mystery. So in the fall of 1932, he wound up writing Hag's Nook and uh, set it in England, in uh, Lincolnshire. And he uh, came up with his character, Dr. Gideon Fell. Now, uh, he enjoyed uh, the, the uh, books by uh, G.K. Chesterton, who was a British author and critic, and was famous for his Father Brown mysteries, and Carr really liked those, uh, those books. And so, uh, being a fan of Chesterton, he decided to kind of take some of Chesterton's mannerisms and personality and uh, uh, appearance, actually, and that's how he fashioned Dr. Gideon Fell after uh, Chesterton. And he even gave uh, Dr. Fell some of the same just manners of speaking. His, he, uh, Chesterton would like to often speak in paradoxes to get kind of twist things around a little bit and get, to, get you thinking. For instance, uh, Dr. Fell in, in uh, uh, a story might uh, be talking to the constable and the constable might say something like, well, everything is right. And then uh, Fell will come back and say, ah, and that's what, that's what makes it so wrong. So he liked those little spins on phrases like that and uh, then brings that into the thought process that Dr. Fell has and his uh, ability to uh, solve crimes. Now, I must admit, I am not that familiar with the character of Dr. Gideon Fell. I've only read that one other book, The Crooked Hinge, before. And in that book, in the video I did for that book, um, I mentioned that I just did not ever get a sense of who Dr. Gideon Fell was. Wasn't really in there. Uh, he served more of a practical purpose in the book. He was the main detective, and he solves the crime. Uh, but... Uh, I didn't get a sense of who the guy was. I just didn't have that. It didn't seem to come across. Didn't really get much of his sense of humor or his uh, thought processes, anything like that. And so all the other characters really came to life for me in that book. All the uh, suspects and victims and, and all of those were fun to read. And I enjoyed all the plot twists and the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the complexity of the crime itself and all the red herrings, and all, all very enjoyable. Um, but uh, the character of Dr. Gideon Fell himself didn't show up for me. And I think that's important. If you love a, a detective character, like I, I've always been a Sherlock Holmes fan, uh, I could be dropped into any Sherlock Holmes story at any point, and I understand Holmes right away. I, I know the backstory and all that, but yet I still want the character to show up. I want to see him figuring things out in his unique way and all his little uh, eccentric habits and all those. I want to have those in each story, and I didn't feel like there was any of that for uh, that uh, Dr. Fell book that I read. He was dressed in a peculiar way, which just seemed like an affectation to me, in that book. Um, it didn't really bring much light or personality to the character as far as just reading about him on the page. To be fair, that was the ninth book in the series, so if fans have been reading all the books before that, maybe they don't need that. But I would think you'd still want to get all of that without telling the whole backstory. You want to get that feeling like you're hanging out with the same guy and uh, enjoy that part. However, just having read Hag's Nook, the first novel in the series, that's di it's completely different. Everyone in is introduced to Dr. Fell for the first time here, and uh, no pun intended, he turns out to be a very well-rounded character, uh, very robust, and uh, quite enjoyable. And you get to even hang out with him at his home and in his study and smoke cigars and drink whiskey with him and all of that and enjoy his his company, and uh, you've got his wife uh, tripping around there and all that. Very enjoyable, very comfortable setting. And uh, yet, it it strikes me also, I don't know this for a fact, but it strikes me reading this, that Carr maybe didn't intend this book to be the first in a series of Dr. Fell stories. It just seems a little too convenient, the way it's set up, that... Uh, the scene of the crime is this ancient abandoned prison 
that's about a quarter of a mile away and perfectly visible from uh, Dr. Fell's study and patio outside, just front row seats to anything that might be going on across the moor uh, looking at that prison. And that seems like a kind of a creepy view to have from your home study. And I wonder if that shows up in any other of the Dr. Fell books or if it just kind of is forgotten about and goes away. But if you look out his study window or you're out on his veranda there looking across the fields there, you can't miss this giant edifice, almost castle-like in grandeur, but yet falling apart, all ivy-covered and creepy, spooky things going on there, rat-infested bats flying around, all that. just seems like a major distraction to have it right outside your home study. Uh, wonder if, if that shows up in other books or not, or if it's even referred to. Because it seems hard to ignore in this one particular story. Anyway, Dr. Fell really shows up in a big way, again, no pun intended, uh, in this story. But it's it's the story of uh, this uh, young American fellow, uh, Tad Rampole, his name is, uh, just out of college. And another reason that makes me think that this might not have been intended to be the first in a series is that I get the feeling reading it that Rampole is a stand-in for John Dixon Carr himself. Uh, he's uh, just coming to England for the first time, so he's bringing his American attitudes and naivete into this new country and culture. And he even meets his wife, his future wife, for the first time during this trip. He runs into her, uh, Dorothy Starberth, uh, at the train station on his way from London to Lincolnshire, where uh, Dr. Fell lives. And uh, so it seems like a similar setup to how Carr met his own wife on, on her first trip out of England. Maybe it just kind of spun around a little bit. And remember, uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, the character of Dorothy Starberth is uh, based on the woman that Carr met a few years earlier in London. Not his wife, Clarice, but another woman that uh, left an impression on him. Uh, that, so the character is is based on... So I I feel like if you're, if you're intending to write... Uh, a series based on a character that uh, it's it's that's where you're going to be putting most of your uh, your own personal insights and things uh, into uh, that thought pattern and not into a character that's going to come and go in the next book might be wrong about that but I will say that all the characters in this book are very enjoyable now I'm not going to have any spoilers in this video but a couple of things there is one character I won't say who it is, but uh, if you've read the story, you know who it is. Uh, but he is out walking one night on his own, and uh, he's about to witness something that is pertinent to the to the mystery here. But while he's just out walking at night in the moonlight and uh, across the meadows and fields and moors, uh, he's just wool gathering. And so you're just in his head. It really has nothing to do with the mystery at all. It's just an insight into how this one character thinks and feels and uh, uh, discusses things with himself. It's very humorous, and I kind of wish there was more of that character in the book. He is in there quite a bit, but just more of his <laughs> his thought processes and things. All the characters are, are pretty enjoyable or dislikable uh, in their proper proportion and all that. And then the only other thing I will say is that I was ultimately disappointed with something that comes up uh, towards the very end of the story. And again, no spoilers here, but it just reveals something to me in the setup as you're piecing all the clues together um, when the crime is uh, uh, during the statement at the end. Uh, of something that, uh, it's a literary device and an event that uh, fell, that uh, uh, Carr used in The Crooked Hinge in that other book that I read, the same exact setup of personality and of chance meeting in both books. And I won't say what it is. If you've read them, you probably know what it is. But why would he use that same device it, it, it just, I, I don't know, it just, it just seemed, I was disappointed when I came across that. Now, again, to be fair, um, uh, it was a really important part of the story of The Crooked Hinge, and it was set up from the very beginning. 
and not so much in uh, Hag's Nook. It's it's just kind of a little explanatory device that only shows up at the end. And and also, uh, this was the first time he used that device in the very first book. It just seems coincidental to me that it showed up in the only two Gideon Fell books that I've read, the same exact setup uh, to one degree or another. So uh, we'll just <laughs> leave it at that. Uh, I enjoyed the book. I don't know if I'm going to go and read any more Dr. Gideon Fell novels or not. I might uh, try the second one and see if it's just as good or uh, maybe propels the, the character further and I can get past the uh, uh, car uh, not using the character that I think is a stand-in for him in another book. Don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. Uh, let me know your recommendations if you think it's worthwhile. I know the character is very popular. Um, and, uh, and I'm a newbie to the character. But uh, what I've read so far, I've had mixed uh, mixed feelings about. I really enjoyed reading it. And by the way, I really enjoy Carr's prose, just the way he writes uh, a sentence. Uh, just jam-packed with information in a very comfortable and cozy way without being overly flowery. Very easy to read and and just just seems like it just, he knows how to tell that tale. Some of the other things might get a little contrived as you go along, but the way he writes them out, very easy to read, so I really enjoy that. But let me know if you think I should keep going on those. Now, all that having been said, now let's get into uh, reviewing some of the artwork that have graced the covers of the Dr. Gideon Fell, of Hag's Nook in particular, uh, down through the years here, and uh, take a look at some of the more interesting points of those. Uh, before I go ahead, I, looking at some of these covers uh, in advance here, I think I should probably set it up with a little of the backstory here that propels the, the story, and that is the legend of uh, Chatterham Prison. And about 150 years or so before the story takes place, uh, we learn that uh, the, uh, the Starbirth family, uh, uh, were the proprietors of the prison. And uh, the first administrator, the first governor of the prison, also owned the property and uh, uh, ran the prison. And uh, so it is handed down through the family from father to son over the generations to this day, although it's now been abandoned for a 100 years or so. Uh, uh, they closed it down after a huge cholera epidemic. But anyway, uh, the, the premise is that each oldest son of the governor before him uh, is duty-bound and legally bound to, on the eve of his 21st birthday at the stroke of midnight, to go into the, uh, the governor's office and unlock a vault and deal with something that is in there for only that first son to see. Then once he's dealt with that and he performs his duties, then his oldest son uh, in the next generation will have to do that same thing and on down through the generations. So that is the premise. And in the story uh, of Hag's Nook, a modern day, even though the prison has not been operated for, for decades now, that uh, legal uh, uh, duty still needs to be performed. And it is Martin Starberth the brother of Dorothy Starbirth, uh, who it's his 25th birthday, and he is now having to go up to uh, deal with whatever is in that vault up in the governor's office uh, it, inside that balcony. And he's scared because there is a history of all the Starbirth men dying of broken necks, and generally from a huge fall from that very balcony, or so it seems. So that's the setup of it, and now we can look at some of these covers, and you'll, uh, we won't have to go, go over this so much again. This is the cover of the first edition uh, published by Harper's in 1933, and the illustration on the dust jacket is by Frank DeBias. But uh, the uh, illustration shows, uh, who I believe is, because of the modern dress, supposed to be Martin Starbirth, that's Dorothy's brother, plummeting to his death, uh, over that uh, that banister or a balustrade, as it's described in the book. However, the illustration here looks like it's the the banister over a mezzanine or overlooking a parlor in a mansion or manor house or something. Not the case. That's supposed to be the balcony outside the governor's office, 
high up on that uh, prison wall that overlooks the, the craggy well below and uh, should be ivy covered and just gloomy and hideous and falling apart. Not this rather elegant looking banister that, that we see here. Now the style of it is a little cartoony, which I think might uh, be representative of some of the lightheartedness of the story. Although <clears throat> the, uh, the book itself has a lot of gloomy and creepy parts to it. And then if we look at the uh, little gallows on the hardcover book that's inside the dust jacket, uh, we see just as kind of a standard gallows, again, not the case. Uh, that gallows should be uh, strutting out from that huge stone wall, that sheer drop, high above the well that the bodies drop into, that is Hag's Nook. And uh, uh, so you are left to wonder here between these the, the cover on the outside and the cover on the inside, uh, just exactly how is it that Martin Starbirth is supposed to meet his his doom here? Is he falling from a great height, like uh, uh, Judas Iscariot, perhaps? Or is he uh, is it death by hanging? Which is it? And uh, like uh, Judas Iscariot, um, you may have to wonder about that for, for a little while here. Now, aside from the illustration itself, if you look at the little yellow sticker there that wraps around from the cover onto the spine... It says, a mystery story, see seal inside for a money-back guarantee. Now, those were big words back in the height of the Depression when this book came out. Harper was doing something kind of interesting in those days to promote their, their book sales and their mysteries in particular. And that was underneath the dust jacket. They had a second wraparound book cover that went inside the book and sealed off the last few chapters of the story. So if you're reading the book and are not getting into it uh, and don't need to get to the last few chapters, you could return that book with the seal unbroken and get your money back. That was the money back guarantee. So that was pretty cool. Uh, don't know how that promoted selling the books, but uh, everyone was looking for a money back guarantee in those days. And so they were offering this. Uh, but wait, there's more. Uh, you could also use that, that uh, wraparound sealed cover as a kind of a proof of purchase certificate. And if you did enjoy the books and you collected 10 of them, you could uh, cut that seal off, that certificate, fill out, fill out the form on it, and send 10 of them in from 10 different books. And uh, Harper would then send you an 11th sealed mystery for free. So that was a pretty good deal. You know, it's like uh, getting your card punched at the local deli there for your for your tenth sandwich. Uh, anyway, uh, that was a, kind of a unique series that Harper was uh, experimenting with. Kind of backfired after a while. Uh, publishing was taking a huge hit anyway, and economically, it just wound up not making sense for Harper. So they discontinued it. I think it ran from 1928 or nine to around 1934 before they just had to. Uh, quit doing it. But in the meantime, they had published 60 of these sealed mysteries, and 10 of those were written by John Dixon Carr, so he did have a good run on those. Uh, towards the end of that decade, publishing was experimenting again now with the paperback format, and uh, <clears throat> that was becoming very popular very quickly because people could buy full books, larger novels and collections of stories at uh, much lower prices, and that was great news in those days. And so uh, in 1940, it was decided that uh, Hag's Nook, it was time for its paperback debut, and Penguin published it in their standard green mystery cover uh, of those days. Everything they, all the mysteries they published had this green standard format that just changed out the title and the author's name. But by 1943, they were adding cover illustrations for all the different titles. And then it started to get a little more interesting. This one is by a cover artist, Raffaello Bussoni, and uh, shows, I believe, that's Martin Starbirth there with the big X on his neck because it is the tradition, or rather the superstition and legend that all Starbirth men uh, die of broken necks and uh, down through the, through the generations, which is part of the mystery here that needs to be solved. And then up above it, looks like up in the sky, but that's actually, I guess, supposed to be in the distance. 
possibly as seen from Dr. Fell's study or from his patio. Uh, that is the Chatterham prison. And uh, uh, this first murder takes place during a rainstorm. So I think the cloud up there is supposed to be raining down onto the prison, but it looks like it's kind of turning into a beam of light, kind of a spotlight shining down on our penguin host down in the lower corner. Uh, but uh, I think it's supposed to be a rain shower. <clears throat> anyway, uh, much more interesting than the plain green cover. And then in 1946, Dell picked up uh, a copyright for Hag's Nook and came out with this really nice painted cover by uh, uh, Robert Stanley. This is a particular scene right out of the story where uh, uh, Tad Rampole and uh, his new girlfriend, Dorothy Starberth, uh, have just been... Uh, visiting Dr. Fell. Dr. Fell and his wife have been out for the evening, so they've been sitting around canoodling with each other, getting to know each other, and uh, they can see the uh, uh, Chatterham prison out the window of Dr. Fell's study, and they see a light on in the governor's office, and there should not be a light on there now. This is uh, just shortly after uh, Dorothy's brother, Martin, has uh, turned up dead with a broken neck. And so there shouldn't be anybody up there, so they are going to go investigate. And the scene on this cover here shows them on their way up to the governor's office, uh, going up uh, staircases and through old cells and a labyrinth of chambers and, and such, and they come across uh, an Iron Maiden covered in cobwebs, and uh, it's startling them. And also just kind of brings a chill to the reader as they realize how hideous this place had been. But uh, very nice painting, I have to say, uh, by Robert Stanley. Uh, really a nice vintage look to it and all that. Of course, it was contemporary at the time. The one problem I have with it, and it's not really a problem because it's meant to sell books, but just the elegance of the Iron Maiden. Uh, very provocative in the lighting there, and uh, it looks like a very elegant statue almost. It's an Iron Maiden, and Iron Maidens were not made with this kind of care uh, in reality. In fact, there's even some speculation that Iron Maidens themselves are uh, a piece of mythology or legend. But uh, the Iron Maidens that are known to exist were just really crude iron boxes with deadly spikes inside, which you can see in this illustration. But then it just had kind of a crude human head edifice up at the top with maybe a scowling mouth or something. Certainly not this kind of an elegant iron maiden, uh, a little, little too pretty. But uh, again, it was meant to sell books, which is very important. Now, this is the edition that I just read, the Dell edition with the Robert Stanley artwork on it. And uh, Dell, in those days, was doing something that was unique to their own paperback books, and that was on the back of many of their books, uh, mysteries, romances, westerns, what have you. Uh, they would often have these map backs, they called them, and uh, always depicting uh, scenes or uh, street maps or old rustic western cattle trails or, or uh, cross-sections of ships or uh, uh, blow-ups of certain buildings, homes, uh, office, offices, what have you. Kind of like an old Clue game, maybe. Uh, but uh, these were really interesting. And so uh, let me show you a few examples, and then we'll talk about this particular one. These were illustrated by Ruth Bellew, and uh, you can see that it, it didn't matter what the book was, whether it was a Western or a romance or whatever. Uh, she would depict sometimes uh, aerial views of little towns or villages or it would be uh, cross sections of, of uh, like the roof taken off of the building so you can see all the different rooms in the house, uh, street maps, all kinds of different things just depending on what the book was about or what it discussed. And uh, I'm so now let's talk about the uh, Hag's Nook back and I'm going to pick a little bit on Ruth Bellew here. I love all these things. I'm a big map guy, by the way, and uh, always enjoy when a book has a map or diagrams of any kind that uh, help you as a reader uh, understand and visualize better what's going on in the description of the story. Um, and uh, she's trying to do that here, but a couple of things. And one is that uh, the story takes place in uh, Chatterham in uh, Lincolnshire. And Lincolnshire is an actual location in England, and it is uh, where it's depicted here in the map. 
but all the all the blow up shows really is just that uh, it is in uh, Lincolnshire and doesn't show where Chatterham is. Uh, I would much rather have seen rather than this just I know where England is and I could figure out where uh, Lincolnshire is. I want to know about Chatterham and we're not getting to see this. We do see some railroad lines that go up to uh, the, the town of Lincoln and then to some various places around the the uh, county. But uh, we don't know what it, where anything else is. It's a fictional town, but uh, she's done that with uh, Western towns and things that are fictional towns, and she just shows us an aerial view where all the buildings and locations are. And I would much rather have seen this, an aerial view of Chatterham, maybe where the railroad line comes in from Lincoln and then where... Uh, uh, U Cottage is, Dr. Fell's house, uh, where the hall is, uh, Starbirth Hall, where the prison is, and maybe a, a cutaway or blowout of the prison so we could see all the catacombs and things like that would have been a lot more satisfying. And now just to, <laughs> just to pick on her a little bit more, her depiction of the prison isn't really accurate. It's supposed to be covered with ivy and vines and uh, uh, the... She, this is really picky on my part here, but even the door and the window on the governor's office here uh, are in the in the wrong places. So I'm really getting a little vicious here uh, with uh, with with poor Ruth Bellew. But I do applaud the uh, uh, the whole series of maps and things like that because I I really do enjoy that kind of a thing, and it's a nice little detail that other book publishers uh, rarely did. And uh, so kudos to Dell back in the in the forties. This is the 1958 Berkeley Books paperback edition with cover art by the great Robert McGuire. And I think this is one of the best of the batch of all the covers we're going to look at in this video here. And uh, here we see uh, Dorothy Starbirth looking aghast at something. And uh, this happens quite often in the book. In the background here, we see what is uh, supposed to be uh, Chatterham Prison and... Uh, uh, again, I'm going to pick a little nit here. It, it looks like it is not ivy covered here or vine covered again, although it's still that massive edifice. And I think uh, other than the ivy or whatever foliage might be drooping off of this thing or should be, uh, it's a, a pretty good uh, depiction, captures the the uh, mood of uh, the entire book, I think. And then we also get to see that silhouette of the uh, hanged man from the gallows there against the moonlight. Now, the moonlight plays a big part in this book because a lot of things are seen un under the full moon. Uh, but we never get to see someone hanging from the gallows in this book. That has not happened at the prison for over 100 years. So here we're looking back at part of the legend of Chatterham Prison. Now, Robert McGuire was the master illustrator of his day, one of the greats. And... Uh, if you're not familiar with his work, it's going to look familiar to you anyway because he was imitated so often. He was such a popular and influential artist that uh, you saw either his work or his work copied by many artists on many, many paperbacks. So it has that, even though it's contemporary for its day, of course, uh, now has a very vintage look that uh, you just see almost everywhere from paperbacks in those days. And... Uh, he was so prolific and uh, so well-revered, always been one of my favorites. I'm going to ha probably have to do a video just on his. So uh, one of the things about him is that he would cover such a range. He would do uh, very classy covers all the way down to, let's just say, uh, the more provocative uh, pulp-type novels. Uh, and so uh, I may save that doing that video for Garb August coming up later in the summer. So we'll, we'll have to see about that. But then now that brings us to the next book here, the 1963 Collier edition of Hag's Nook. And uh, there's just not really much to say about this one. This is a real uh, step back from what we've seen up until now, just very generic. Uh, and this, uh, just a burning candle. Uh, there are plenty of burning candles in the story, so uh, it's not inappropriate. And there's really nothing wrong with the book here or with the artwork here, the cover, except that it just is so flat footed. Uh, it, this could be put on almost any creepy novel uh, and be just as successful, uh, which isn't very. So we'll just we'll just move on from here. 
And I won't spend much time with this one here either. Uh, this is the 1966 Collier edition for Hag's Nook. And uh, the only reason I'm really going to spend a minute on this is because it is credit, credited to Milton Glaser uh, and his uh, Pushpin Studios, which was another very influential uh, uh, art studio uh, back in the, the 50s and 60s, kind of in the Mad Men era and then beyond. And so I'm only showing it because... Uh, his influence on pop art was so huge that these other examples of, of his work or of his studio's work uh, are so recognizable. Just to give you an idea of where Hag's Nook fits in, which I don't really know that it does. We just see a rat here with either a bow tie or uh, a, a strip of blue bacon. I don't know what that is. Maybe it's a piece of Bob Dylan's hair from the next image over from there. But plenty of rats in the story, so it's not inappropriate, just like that candle there. But uh, it doesn't really have much to do with the uh, with the story itself, other than it's just kind of a, a prop <laughs> from the book. And uh, as far as uh, artwork uh, goes, it's kind of unimpressive. So we'll just leave it at that. And uh, thanks for the attempt there, Milton Glaser, but we'll remember you for other things. This is the 1971 Haro uh, edition. Uh, Haro is a portmanteau of Harper and Rowe publishers. And uh, the cover here is designed by One Plus One Studio. And in this case, One Plus One does not equal two. This cover really bugs me uh, for a few reasons. One is, and there's nothing too much wrong with this, but it's just showing... Uh, a stock shot of a castle, which is okay. It's it's the the prison itself looks enough like a castle compared to the description, which I guess is all right. Uh, but it's a very weak photo. And then the thing that really bugs me about this thing is I guess that's supposed to be a puzzle piece around it, kind of a overused metaphor for a mystery. But is that really a jigsaw puzzle piece? It looks like someone just made up what they had dreamed of a puzzle piece in a nightmare or something because it just is just so random and and choppy and clunky. No actual jigsaw puzzle would ever have a piece shaped like like this. And then uh, when uh, I saw this image, uh, uh, another thing, I thought that there had been some kind of a, a watermark or a... a uh, publisher's stamp or something that had leaked onto the the image itself there it looked like there were some markings some numbers and letters and things and some some dark lines but on really squinting at it and zooming in on it it looks like it is the hands of a clock at about 10 to midnight and that's about right there is a there is a discrepancy of 10 minutes around midnight that is a, a point of the plot in the book. But why would you make it so ghosted and hard to see and unnoticeable? Book covers are supposed to grab your attention and make you want to buy that book uh, off the shelves. And something like this is just not doing that. From a distance, it just looks like a yellow blob. You're never going to see, even on looking at this thing for a couple of minutes, it took me to figure out the clocks of, or the hands of the clock there. So this one gets a, a complete fail to me. Uh, sorry, One Plus One Studio. I, I hope you did well in, or better in later years. Now we have the 1985 edition put out by International Polygonics Limited, uh, of whom I'm sure you are very familiar with. Uh, but this one is just kind of average, in my opinion. Uh, nothing terribly wrong with it, uh, but I'm going to pick it apart anyway, uh, just because it, it doesn't really jump off the shelf for me, and I, I think that's what a book cover is supposed to do. Uh, but again, nothing really wrong with it. It's it's just another rat, and uh, plenty of rats in the story, so that's fine. Uh, and then uh, sitting in uh, one of the prison windows. But I would say that's either a very small prison window or a very large rat. And I, I can assume there can be some pretty large rats in some of these prisons, so no problem with that. We got the little moon out there. That's fine. That ties in with the story. But uh, it's just kind of a, a so what idea, I think. It seems like one of the first ideas that an art director might have rattled off 
to the cover artist. So I can't really blame the cover artist here. And it's, it's Roger Roth, who is pretty well known in uh, later years as being a really great children's book artist. And uh, so maybe this came to him either with some weak art direction or it was early in his career and he was still kind of uh, finding his sea legs or something. But uh, I would just give this one kind of a, a C, maybe a C plus or something. And then uh, I think that's all we need to say about that one. And then we get to this one, which again is very mediocre, a few steps down even from the one we just saw here, I think. Uh, this is the 1999 Mystery Guild uh, uh, edition, and it's nothing more than a stock shot of a creepy old tree with a vulture flying over it. Now, we get no vultures in the story at all, although uh, it does not seem out of place for the setting. But this could be put on any book that has a creepy setting or a spooky, haunted type of surroundings at all. It doesn't really do much for me. And uh, if this is supposed to be on a bookshelf for sale, uh, why is the title way down at the bottom? It seems like that would need to show up above any books on the shelf in front of it, perhaps. And then uh, John Dixon Carr's name is fading away almost to nothing at the top. So uh, I, I, I wouldn't give this one uh, much of a passing grade. It's pretty mediocre in, in my opinion. You may disagree. Um, this book is, uh, there. if you're looking for an edition, a print copy of Hag's Nook, there are tons of these out there, though. So this was one of the books that uh, was making the rounds uh, for quite a while, and uh, you can still find them out there a lot. But now we're going to move on to uh, the 2011 Rue Morgue Press edition, and this is the worst of the lot, in my opinion. Uh, at least we got... A, a real Iron Maiden here. This is what an Iron Maiden would actually look like, not like that that golden goddess on the book we saw a little earlier. Uh, but uh, uh, it, this is just such a between-the-eyes photo of a pretty stark image that someone went to the trouble to mask around so they could knock out whatever background was in the photo to begin with. And if you're going to do that, what, and just are you just going to put a flat color behind it? Why don't you just bleed that flat color across the whole book? Why do you then have to frame it out with another flat color? Uh, it's just too stark. It's If you saw this on a bookshelf in a bookstore, would that sing out to you from across all the other books in the mystery section and, and grab your attention. To me, it just looks like it might be a page out of a museum catalog or something. Uh, so uh, we'll just uh, uh, clamp a clothespin on our nose and, and try to move on here to our final entry, which is starting to step back up again. And this is the, the 2019 Polygon Books edition with a cover by Abigail Salver Salverson. And... Uh, uh, to me, this is a big improvement over what we've seen in the last several books here. Uh, I still have a few little problems with this one, though. And one is just this flat art style that we see more and more and more of these days. And uh, it's just, to me, again, nothing wrong with it. It's kind of a subjective call. It's just that this is what we are getting more and more of these days, these flat outline shapes of colors. Uh, calling themselves book covers, and uh, uh, I guess they're fine. Uh, I just miss the old, highly illustrated vintage styles, uh, and that's maybe that's on me. Uh, one uh, positive note of these kinds of book covers is that they show up really well online. That's probably where uh, the vast majority of books are purchased now, so it does have that advantage, and that uh, uh, undoubtedly has a, a huge uh, reason behind why we have so many of these flat art covers these days. Um, the layout is fine. Nothing wrong with the layout. I think that's that's uh, pretty good. We do finally get to see Dr. Gideon Fell here in all his portly glory. But one of the things I'll, I'll pick at here is why is he wearing his hat and cape inside his, uh, uh, his uh, uh, studio or his study rather? Uh, here, at least you can see that looking out his windows, which should be uh, a, a lattice work, some uh, diamond-shaped panes, but that's a detail we can overlook here. But you can see what, what he has to look at every day when he's working in his study or sitting out in his garden is that giant prison looming over him with the, with the 
full moon, bats flying around it all the time. I wonder what that does to his property values there at U Cottage. I can only imagine. And then uh, this is really picking at some nits here, but it's just the... Uh, I know why they did it, some creative license to get those nice angled beams of light casting in from, from the moonlight. But they're not radiating from the moon. They're coming up from something higher up and further away than the moon. There's just the direction of the lighting is is wrong. But uh, a huge step up, I still say, from the book covers that came just directly before this. And if you were to get a new copy of Hag's Nook today, this would be the cover you would get on whether it was a, a print edition or an ebook. Uh, this is the current cover uh, that you'd be buying. So uh, that's it. That's uh, 12 covers that we've uh, taken a look at here covering uh, uh, over 90 years of this title's existence. And we'll just take a, a one last look at uh, the uh, gallery of Hag's Nooks. And let me know in the comments below if you have any favorites out of this, if you've got a particular favorite, if you've got one that really makes you hold your nose, one of your least favorites, that'd be kind of interesting and fun to know. And uh, also let me know uh, if you're a, particularly a, a Dr. Gideon Fell fan, because uh, I've only read the two books, and, and I'm uh, looking for recommendations if you think that... Uh, I should be encouraged to read more, Dr. Fell. Uh, let me know. And then uh, I think that kind of brings us to the end of this adventure. And I think I've got a few hours of March left to post this up. So if you've stuck with me this far, I really appreciate it. I know that was a lot of covers to, to work through. But uh, that's what I'm here for. So you've got to deal with that. And I do thank you for it. And uh, until we have a chance to chat again, Thanks a lot and happy Easter.